is Tony Blazer back again with another video here for the Motocross Vault on YouTube. For this one, what we're going to do is take a look back at the 1987 Honda lineup. I'm going to use go through the brochures. I have all the ones for the 87 CRs. Definitely one of my favorite years for Honda. Um, I had the 125 that year. It's the last year for the blue seats, the last year for the gold rims. Um, and pretty much across the line, they were all great motorcycles that year. Uh, definitely one of the high watermarks for 1980s Hondas. Um, if you like this sort of thing, make sure you subscribe and click on the little bell to get notified when I post another one. As you can see, I have quite a collection of brochures and magazines, and uh, everybody keeps digging them. We'll keep doing them. So without further ado, here's the 87 Honda CRs. All right, the first machine we're going to take a look at here is the CR80R for 1987. Um, the CR, this bike doesn't look a whole lot different than the 86 or actually even the 85 model for that matter. Uh, the body work was new in 85. 86 added uh, an all-new motor that made a huge amount of difference on the uh, CR. Previously, it was a decent handling bike, but it wasn't very fast, uh, particularly compared to the Kawasaki at the time. But in 86, they put an all-new 83cc liquid-cooled uh, two-stroke in this bad boy, and it just flew. Um, it had two more horsepower than any other 80 in the class. It uh, didn't have a power valve. Uh, actually, the 85, it had like a crude kind of a, the original ATAC system which was like an exhaust valve that was a little sub chamber off the exhaust that was supposed to give you a little more torque by uh, changing the characteristics of uh, the exhaust pipe giving you a little more head pipe volume at low RPM but it never worked really great on these things um, even on the CR wasn't wasn't the best in terms of that uh, but for 86 they got rid of that altogether went just with a straight up uh, exhaust on it no, no uh, power valve of any kind but the motor still ran really great these uh you know even if you're an adult and you get on these mid 80s crs they just they just rip um for 86 they added a few little things they changed the uh, piston ring around to give it a little bit more durability also an issue with some of these uh, crs they went through uh, pistons and rings pretty quick these if you didn't stay on top of the bike got pretty ratty uh pretty quick uh they also changed the reed valve um beefed up the clutch a little bit but the basic motor was the same. It, it ran pretty much the same as it did in uh, 86. Still the fastest uh, 80 in the class. Um, on the suspension side, they did beef up the forks. Uh, they added uh, 2 millimeters to the fork diameter for 87. Went up to a 35 millimeter fork, uh, which is pretty pretty small by modern standards, but uh, definitely an improvement over the 33s that are used in 86. Um, that was kind of not, not really one of the strong suits of this CR. The suspension was probably the weakest link in the chassis. Uh, it had a really fast motor. The ha uh, bike handled well, super sharp turning, uh, but the suspension was soft and uh, just really wasn't great for a fast kid. Uh, if you were really fast, you probably would need to get the suspension done on this bike. Um, like I said, overall bike, though, was really, really a good bike this year. Um, it was probably the best uh, best choice if you're an expert. You know, of all the magazine shootouts, it was picked as number one for the expert, mainly due to the uh, really fast motor. But the bike could be a bit of a handful for uh, novices and small kids. All right, next up is the CR125 for 1987. Uh, for 87, this bike was completely redesigned. It was an all-new machine. This is a bike I did own. Um, it was a uh, really, really awesome motorcycle, maybe one of the best Honda motorcycles ever built when you compare it you know, against machines of its time. Um, the engine was all-new this year. It still used the ATAC system, which was the stood for Automatic Torque Amplification Chamber, which, like I said, was a little resonance chamber, a little extension to the exhaust manifold that would um, basically open up at low rpms and kind of trick the motor into thinking the bike had a larger exhaust pipe on it what that would do is in theory give the bike more torque but then when it hit a, a certain point in the rpm range a centrifugal ball governor would snap open and, and close off that valve to give you kind of a straight through exhaust so essentially what it tried to do is trick the motor into thinking you had two different exhaust pipes at the same time uh, it never worked really great um, these bikes ran really well but uh, if you actually, some aftermarket pipes even disconnected the ATAC altogether, um, did away with it completely, and the bike seemed to run better. So it was kind of one of those uh, gimmicks. It was Honda's earliest version of a power valve, you know, if you want to call the, the ATAC a power valve. Uh, but it, like I said, it wasn't, it was, these bikes ran well on top. None of them were, were torque monsters, though. Eventually, though, uh, this technology would make its way into other power valve systems. Kawasaki's uh, KIPP system actually uses a version of the ATAC and a variable exhaust port. Uh, so basically by combining the two technologies of like the Yamaha power valve system 
uh, and the, the ATAC, you got kind of like the modern version of what uh, two strokes use for a power valve system. So there was some merit to it, but uh, like I said, this early version of it uh, didn't work the best. Um, the rest of the motor, though, was all new as well. It went from a uh, cylinder intake to a case read intake. Um, the chassis was new, completely redesigned. Uh, this was the first year for the cartridge forks on the 125. Um, prior, prior to this, it used like a damper rod style forks. In 86, the 250 and the 500 had uh, the cartridge dampers, uh, but the 125 had to uh, do with the old style stuff. Uh, cartridge forks, when they came out, were a huge improvement, and that this is one of the one of the big advantages the CR had over the competition in 87. It was the only 125 um, that was... Actually, come to think of it, maybe Suzuki... I guess Suzuki had the cartridges in 125 that year as well. So Kawasaki and Yamaha were still using uh, damper rods, and I think, if I remember right, uh, Honda and Suzuki had the uh, cartridges in 87. Um, I love the looks of this thing. That up-the-tank saddle gives the bike a kind of a sleeker appearance. Uh, the tank does have a little, little bit of a, a droop to it on the left, it drops down to lower the center of gravity. It's it's not as dramatic as what they had in uh, on the uh, 250 and 88, but uh, definitely a little bit lower center of gravity than what they had in 86. Uh, the new side panels were, were a little bit sleeker. Love the gold rims. This is the last year, like I said, for the gold rims on the uh, CRs, and I just love this look overall. The blue fork boots, uh, pretty much everything front to back. Um, this bike, like I said, was a phenomenal machine in its time. It was uh, the fastest 125, had the most um, kind of the most powerful uh, power band in the class. Didn't have quite the uh, low end hit of like the Yamaha, but it had a much better, uh, much better top end pull. Um, great all around motorcycle. Uh, really, the only issue with it in terms of performance was the shock. Um, in '87, they went to like a uh, kind of a piggyback style. They called it. What they did was basically uh, instead of having the remote reservoir uh, bolted um, to the frame, connected by a, a little tube. Uh, they actually made the shock into one solid unit with the remote reservoir uh, included into the shock body itself, just like a modern, actually all the shocks now have the same setup, but this was the first year they went to that setup. Uh, the only problem with it was uh, they went with a canister that was mounted to the top of the shock, like a piggyback, like somebody riding piggyback, hence the name, um, and the issue with that was it, it was kind of buried up in uh, in the bodywork and didn't get a lot of cooling air and uh, all, all three of the full-size bikes that used it had some fade issues, but uh, that was really the only quibble in this thing. Otherwise, it was a really a phenomenal motorcycle all around. All right, next up, we have the CR250R for 1987. Uh, this bike was um, not quite as thoroughly redesigned as the 125. Uh, the chassis was new, had a new frame, uh, new, new body work as well. Um, the swing arm was all new. The Pro Link was redesigned. Uh, it maintained the same 43 millimeter shower forks. Like I said, it had the uh, uh, cartridge forks in 86, so it wasn't as big of a uh, step up in performance as on the 125. Uh, the motor was only uh, slightly changed for 87. Uh, the CR250 had got an all new motor in 1986, so that's when they went to the uh, Honda PowerPort, which was a uh, much more effective version of a power valve than the ATAC system had been. This one actually had a pair of. Uh, sliding guillotine valves that uh, came and covered or uncovered the top of the exhaust port to kind of vary the port timing. Um, it worked a lot better than the ATAC had, although it was uh, very complicated to work on and really easy to screw up. Like I said, I've had a couple of these CRs, and uh, if you get the ATAC wrong, it really jacks up the performance. Um, there were some porting changes as well for 87 that gave the bike a, uh, a much more dramatic uh, mid and top end pull. The 86 motor had been extremely smooth, kind of an electric power band. And for 87, they really beefed up the hit in the motor. Um, pros really liked it. It was it was more powerful for sure, but it wasn't as easy to ride. Uh, some people didn't really care for that. Um, the shock had the same kind of issues here. You can see how um, the, the piggyback design here is on the CR250. It was the same on all, all three bikes. Um, when that bodywork is on the bike, it uh, just didn't get much cooling air, so there were some fading issues. And even when it was uh, fresh, the shock was a little bit uh, persnickety. It kicked a lot and wasn't wasn't the best. Really, really the only um, kind of weak link in the CR package this year. Uh, overall, ergonomics were excellent for the time. Uh, tank, you know, if you sit on it now, it feels a little pudgy compared to like the 88 and 89 and later ones. But uh, for the time, it was considered very good. It wasn't quite as narrow as the KX that year. The KX was like super slim. Uh, but overall, the bike was uh, it was a real comfortable machine. Uh, my only beef with it, like I said, was the um, 
the shock was really not that great. Uh, the brakes were new this year. They added the rear disc brake. They actually, I forgot to mention on the 125, they got a rear disc as well. Uh, all three of the big bikes. This was the first year for the disc in the back. And uh, these were great brakes at the time. They were, um, all the disc brakes, you know, worked better than drums, but some of them were pretty grabby, the early discs. I remember my, uh, I had an 88YZ, and that thing was like a light switch. And uh, that was the first year for Yamaha with the disc. And the 87CR was much more progressive. It had really great power, but the nice thing about it was they, uh, they were real progressive. They didn't uh, just wasn't you know all or nothing. Uh, some of the other bikes, Kawasaki's and uh, the Yamahas, they were kind of like it was easy to stall the motor. It was a little bit uh, too grabby at first till they kind of got that whole thing figured out. But um, overall, this thing was uh, by far the best bike in the class. Uh, the cartridge forks were just phenomenal. And like I said, the only bike that even could come close was the Suzuki, which had cartridges as well. Um, the Kawasaki and uh, Yamaha with their uh, damper rod forks, forks weren't even close. And uh, the motor here was uh, just excellent. Uh, I think this, again, uh, a real high water mark, maybe the, the high water mark for Honda in the 80s. Uh, this thing was still an iconic machine, and that's why so many people still you know, treasure them and ride them today. All right, last up for 1987, we have the mighty CR500R. Um, at this point in the 80s, the 500 class, as far as Honda and Kawasaki were concerned at least, uh, we're still uh, worthy of all the updates that the small bikes got for the most part. Uh, about the only thing the 500 didn't get in 87 that the smaller bikes got was a, obviously a power valve system. This 500 uh, motor would basically be the same engine that would be used through 2001 when the uh, CR500 was finally retired eventually. Uh, no power valve, no ATAC, no uh, HPP, nothing. Just a straight up uh, old-fashioned, uh, basically, other than liquid cooling, the same kind of bike you would have seen on a, um, you know, an early 70s uh, open-class bike. Uh, in spite of that, though, it still put out phenomenal power. These things were just rockets. Uh, in fact, they're faster than the later ones. They actually detune these over the years as they, um, the 85 and 86 are probably the, probably the most powerful of any of them. Uh, those things were just like, you know, shoulder destroyers. They were so powerful, but um, over time, they kind of detuned them, put more restrictive exhausts on them, geared them up, uh, changed the porting and stuff to try and make them a little mellower, but uh, these things were really, really fast. Um, for 87, they uh, changed a few little minor things. They lengthened the connecting rod um, and basically just dicked around with the flywheel weight a little bit just to try and make the bike a little smoother. Um, one of the only kind of gripes with this engine was it was just an absolute nightmare to start. The, the kickstarter on this thing was high and at an awkward angle. And it uh, it was not like one of these bikes where you could just kind of, you know, take a half-hearted boot at it. You had to, uh, either if you weren't tall, you need to stand on something or find a hill or get a good solid kick or the thing would just uh, uh, kind of laugh at you and pop. Um, suspension was, uh, like the small bikes, um, great up front, mediocre out back. It wasn't enough to keep the bike from being, uh, you know, one of the best 500s available at the time. But uh, the shock a lot of times is funny with the, the added power... Um, and weight of the 500 seemed to sometimes work a little better uh, on the suspension end than the smaller bikes did with the Hondas. Uh, something about the way they set them up, sometimes the big bike worked better, and the 500 actually wasn't too bad this year. Uh, the body work was, uh, at least in the American versions, they got a, a new tank. Uh, as you can see, the saddle here goes up uh, similarly to what it does in the 125 and the 250. The tank itself is a little wider, obviously, because it's going to carry a little more fuel. In other markets, like in Australia and some other places, they kept the uh, really kind of large, bulbous 86 tank in 87. But here in America, we got the smaller one. Um, you know, we don't run 45-minute motos here in the U.S. Even in 87, they weren't doing that. So I guess the uh, fuel capacity wasn't as much of a concern. Um, this thankfully got the rear disc brake that the other bikes got as well. Uh, overall, a phenomenal motorcycle um, and just like the, all the rest of them treasured today, the 87s, pretty much if you can get your hands on any 87 CR, whether it's an 80, 125, uh, 250, or 500, you got uh, a collectible bike. You know, if it's in good shape, it's worth a lot of money. And uh, other than the known issues like corrosion in the water pump and stuff, unfortunately all these bikes use like a magnesium water pump and um, they turn to sludge inside over time. They kind of corrode really bad. That was a really big issue. Um, wasn't a problem in 87, of course, but, uh, if you go to buy one of these now, it's, a, it's an issue on these bikes, but, um, really that's the only, only real major problem, the, pretty much, uh, solid other, otherwise. Um, I would love to have one of these. I've never had an 87 500, uh, definitely one of those ones I'd love to add to my stable is, uh, I've had a lot of bikes, but not one of these. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed this. This has uh, been my look back at the 87CR lineup here uh, through the brochures. And uh, like I said, if you like some more, let me know. We'll do some more like this. And uh, I'll talk to you soon.